Hoffman on a really beautiful Thursday, May 7th outside. Um, uh, the conference today is going to be on multimodality cardiac imaging. But I wanted to um, thank all of the faculty and fellows who have prepared really spectacular conferences um, by this technique. It's a little awkward, but I'm always gratified uh, to see the content has really been amazing. Um, the feedback has been amazing. Um, we have all of the last week's, this week's conferences moving forward. We're putting on CC Live Keyses, uh, Kimberly Acosta and Dr. Sharma have provided a site. Um, so those people who can't hear them live, they are recorded there. And I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Stern and Anna Pina for um, helping with that technically. But these conferences really have been very well received. Um, and, and again, it's um, uh, amazing that people have been able to take time out of their otherwise hectic mm -hmm. day uh, to put the content together. Uh, today is a special conference. Um, in honor of Sandy Friedman, um, so that he can give us his comments that we uh, missed um, on imaging. Uh, okay. Imaging has been a crucial part of the evaluation of patients, particularly echocardiography. And we all have to tip our hats to Laurie Croft, who um, really has put herself uh, physically and mentally, emotionally um, into this uh, fight against coronavirus. Um, she and uh, Gennaro Giustino are putting together a collection between the United States and Italy over 300 echocardiograms, which I think is going to be a very important paper um, in letting us know what is the extent and severity of the troponin leak significance, what is the extent of ischemic injury and cardiac injury. I think it's going to be a very important paper um, in a, a probably uh, a week from today or so, I'm sorry, uh, maybe two weeks from today, um, what we'll do is have people uh, presenting some of the very fine research which is being done. I'm sorry for taking so much time, but um, today I'm really very looking forward uh, to today's special conference on cardiac imaging. We'll probably do another session next uh, week or the following week. And I want to introduce Tom Larakis and extend uh, my thanks to him for organizing this and um, to making sure all of our imaging uh, goes on as normal as possible in this difficult time. Tom? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Goldman. For, thank you, Dr. Goldman. For, there? Yes. I have to unmute yes. your microphone, Dr. Larakis. Yes. What, Marty, he is, he is unmuted. He is unmuted. I can hear Dr. him. Dr. Larakis? Yes. I can hear him. Yes. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, today we'll have a special conference. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Goldman for giving us the opportunity to present. And um, I decided to give, uh, to, to mix up things a little bit. Uh, basically, I would like to, um, uh, to have, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, presentations before. We would like to have the radiology perspective uh, of imaging for uh, COVID-19. And uh, then we'll present uh, two cases. Also, I decided to have uh, uh, people and fellows from other uh, hospitals of the Mount Sinai Health System to present so they can share their experience uh, with COVID uh, with all of us. So first will be uh, Dr. Bernheim, who's an assistant professor here in uh, the Department of Radiology. Uh, I know Dr. Bernheim from my time in Emory when we were working together. And it's a pleasure to have him also here to, and work together in uh, uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, Dr. Bernheim is uh, one of the first, actually, who described the findings of COVID on a CT uh, chest imaging as well as in the X-ray. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, him give us the first uh, presentation of the morning. And then we go to Mount Sinai West for a case presentation. And then we'll come back to Emory for a presentation here from... Uh, our uh, own, own department here by our uh, imaging fellow, Dr. Brian Rajan. So with other, with uh, not much to say, uh, we'll have Dr. Bernheim give his uh, talk this morning. 
uh, thank you, Stan, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, but I'm getting an error message that I cannot while another participant is sharing. Do you know if it's possible for the organizer to just make me the screen uh, share? Oh, we, we can see it now, Adam. Okay. Uh, I see you. If you can, you can share your screen. Can Adam, everybody now see sharing. my uh, title slide of overview and updates of COVID-19? No, but let me see if I can go back to, um, I think the imaging fellow is sharing the screen. So let's have that fellow stop sharing. Yeah, I stopped sharing, Dr. Bernard. Okay, let me try again. Very good. Try again, Adam. Okay. You're on. Okay, you're on, good yeah. Work. Okay, terrific. Great, great. Okay, perfect. So um, I was asked to give an overview uh, from a radiology perspective of COVID-19 and sort of an update of where we stand to this point. Um, I was asked to do this in a way that was sort of general to provide context and, and it's not necessarily a talk focused on, on cardiology or cardiac imaging specifically. I think that will come later in the session. Some of this will be a little bit more general, but I think it's very helpful as physicians for us to maintain a proper perspective and context of sort of the history and the epidemiology and the imaging findings of COVID-19. So this um, this talk is a bit dense. I have uh, a lot of information and a lot of data, so I'm going to go very quickly, but I think it's helpful to go through a lot of data quickly, and by the end, I'm going to try to finish in about 25 minutes. We will have, I, I think, a good sense of um, where we've been and where we are and, uh, and where, where we might be going in terms of COVID-19. No relevant disclosures. So I'd like to start with just a brief moment of introduction and virology. I think it's uh, a reminder that we all know that this is a, a disease that began and really emerged for the first time in 2019 in Wuhan that was felt to have a zoonotic origin and a novel coronavirus was identified as the source. Um, we remember that there was a rapid increase in China in the first month of 2020 and disease first was reported in the United States shortly thereafter. By uh, January 30th of 2020, the WHO had declared a global health emergency. And recently, uh, about a week ago, the United States caseload exceeded a million. And I think it's helpful to have a timeline, sort of a sense that this is all uh, what we've lived through. But uh, this is a disease that first emerged at the end of 2019. And uh, by January 11th, China reported its first death. By the end of January, the WHO had declared a global health uh, emergency. And the first cases in the United States uh, started to appear shortly thereafter. It was really around mid-February, if you remember, uh, when disease started to extend beyond China in significant numbers that things started to change dramatically. Here in mid-February, uh, stock markets were still all-time high highs, global equity markets still making all new time, new time highs. And then when you had significant number of cases here in February in Iran and Italy, that started to really, um, uh, the global scale of this pandemic started to really emerge and we started to have deaths in the United States. The WHO declared a pandemic by March 11th and the United States uh, banned travel from Europe that same day. And here at this point in by mid-March, uh, New York, as we know, certainly became uh, an epicenter here in North America. By the end of March, about a third of humanity was under some form of lockdown. And uh, at this point here in early May 2020, we have uh, more than 3 million cases. Just a one brief word on virology. Um, the, path, the phylogeny here is the genus beta coronavirus, and it's um, about 96% identical to other bat coronavirus samples. This is uh, a single strand positive sense RNA virus, which is important to note just because it means that the virus can mutate quickly and it allows for episodic novel viruses to emerge. And uh, one important pathophysiologic mechanism that we know is that it binds the ACE2 receptor, which is present in the lungs, myocardium, and kidneys. And we know these S spike proteins that we've seen many times. And the genome is large and encodes many proteins. And the reason this is important is because it makes the virus very adaptable, both in the environment and in hosts, and it can easily transmit from animals to humans. And at this point, we know transmission is human to human, primarily via respiratory droplets and close contact. There's a, a nice article in New England Journal that describes how long COVID-19 can live on common surfaces. And um, in, within air, it can live for up to about three hours, on cardboard for maybe about a day, and on plastic for a few days. There has been some data that shows that virus can live even longer. We know the case of the cruise ship, which was abandoned for 17 days, and upon going back, it was found to have significant amounts of live virus after 17 days. So a lot of this is very variable depending on temperature and humidity. Thank you. 
I think it's also important to have some sense of history to understand uh, prior coronaviruses that have occurred in the past. So very briefly in two minutes, I just want to touch on that. This is the seventh coronavirus that's been known to infect humans. The first four cause upper respiratory infections. Then we had SARS earlier this century, MERS emerged a few years later after that, and now we have COVID-19. SARS, severe acute respiratory disease, the vector here is the mask palm civet. It, bega civet. it began in November of 2012 in the Guangdong province of China. This is in Southeast China near Hong Kong, uh, more than 100 million people in this province. The number of cases in SARS rapidly increased but by July 2003, the disease was completely gone and there has never been another documented case of SARS since. This is a disease that has completely burned out. This is the mask palm civet, which was the vector in SARS. And here's just a graph showing how SARS quickly spread here in early 2003 and peaked in the spring and then it burned out and there's been never a, a case of SARS ever since. In contrast, MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, is spread by the dromedary camel that was the initial vector. It began in April 2012 in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia. This is the dromedary camel. And most cases were confined to the Middle East. There was a significant number of cases in South Korea that was all traced to one businessman who did travel um, from, to Kuwait and came back to South Korea. In the United States, there were only two cases, both also travel related. Unlike SARS, MERS has had episodic peaks, uh, often in hospitals and families, and there are peaks up until today. This is a disease that has not burned out. Here you can see a sense of MERS, again, clustered primarily in the Middle East and just a handful of cases in uh, Western Europe, the United States, and that, and that uh, case um, in South Korea causing a spike there. And here's MERS. Uh, again, this is a disease that has experienced episodic peaks throughout the years and continues to be a, sort of an ongoing episodic phenomenon that has not burned out. And I think it's helpful to contrast SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. So in terms of number of countries, COVID-19 at this point is in almost every country uh, in, in the world. The number inf of infections in SARS was only about 8,000 uh, with a mortality of nearly 10%. MERS actually had a very high mortality. Over a third of patients with MERS died. Um, in terms of COVID-19, the number of infections at this point we're up to over 3.7 million. This is data as of this morning from Johns Hopkins. The number of deaths globally is now at over 264,000. And again, SARS burned out with never a case since 2003. MERS has had intermittent outbreaks and COVID-19 is an ongoing process as we know. I wanna to briefly touch on some of the epidemiology before then diving into the imaging. This is the map from Johns Hopkins University. I think we've all seen this data to gain some global perspective of the pandemic as disease that started in China, but now it's actually Europe and the United States that have large number of cases and have emerged as epicenters with disease really everywhere. Again, spreading to more than 185 countries throughout the world. In the United States, of course, we know all too well that New York has emerged as the epicenter with other cities also having a lot of disease and every state having at least one case. In terms of the total number of confirmed cases over the course of time, we can see that as of today, we're still in this sort of linear upward trend. We haven't yet quite peaked. Perhaps there's a slight slowing in the slope, but uh, in the United States, we're well past that point, and uh, the caseload continues to rise every day at a fairly linear rate in the last couple of weeks. In terms of the daily number of new confirmed cases, this is helpful to try to identify a peak in the globally across the world, the number of new cases is about 80,000 the last several days. So it's sort of leveled off a little bit. In the United States, we're getting about 30,000 cases per day over the last several days. So sometimes you can only appreciate a peak well in retrospect, but we're hoping that um, this is sort of forming here. In terms of the total number of deaths, similarly, we're still in an upward trend, both globally and in the United States, with a perhaps slight slowing of the slope. And the total number of daily deaths is also uh, you know, fairly constant, both in the United States and world throughout the last several days. I also think it's helpful to have some perspective of where the deaths are coming from. So we remember that early on in the beginning of uh, the pandemic, the disease was primarily focused in China, but that's really uh, faded significantly. And at this point, it's really North America and Europe that are accounting for most of the deaths. This is data from about a week ago showing that the United States has exceeded 63,000 deaths. It's even higher than that now. And the other countries that have experienced the most deaths are primarily in Western Europe, as you can see here, uh, accounting for 
Uh, most of the other countries with the most deaths, uh, China is actually not even on this list. The number of reported deaths there is actually even lower than this. And if we index the number of uh, cases per million to the population, I think it's also helpful to index the caseload uh, per population. We can also see that um, relatively China actually is uh, reporting a smaller number of cases, and reportedly there are more cases in the United in the United States and Europe. And um, and it's helpful to I think have some source some sense of the uh, the the uh, epidemiology index per population. I think mortality is also important to keep in mind. A hundred years ago, we had the Spanish flu, which had about a 2.5% mortality. There have been severe influenza outbreaks over the years um, that have had mortalities up to about 0.1%. Ebola infected a small number of people, but had a very high mortality. SARS was almost 10%, MERS about a third. And mortality here in COVID-19 is really unknown. It's been described as between 1.4 and 3.5%. Um, some people feel this is actually much lower. The unknown here is the denominator of how many people are really infected, which is something we really don't know that well. So uh, if that number is higher, the mortality may actually be a little bit lower than this. But uh, it's also helpful to have some context of the number of deaths caused by previous infections in our history. So smallpox uh, is by far number one. Actually, more than 300 million people have died of smallpox just since 1900. It's incredible. Um, we also remember six and a half centuries ago, the Black Death that killed 225 million people throughout the world. The Spanish flu 100 years ago killed at least 50 million people. And then several flu epidemics uh, in the past hundred years have also killed about a million people each. Swine flu, which remember we remember from a decade ago, um, killed somewhere between 150 and 575,000 people. And COVID, this data is a little bit old here for COVID, so it's now more in line with swine flu, sort of in this range here. In contrast, MERS and SARS, the other coronaviruses, um, both much lower on this list with one less than a thousand deaths each. Also, we know that there is a mortality rate uh, distinction based on patient age. It's really the patients that are older that have a much higher mortality. We know patients that are younger have a very low mortality um, compared to older patients. That's something that's been borne out across different countries in different continents from Korea to Spain to China. We really, see this trend in increasing mortality and increasing age, uh, which, is very, uh, which is very consistent across many countries. We also know that um, more men die from COVID-19 than women. About two-thirds of deaths of COVID-19 are occurring in men. Um, and we can see that across many countries, it's pretty consistent. Finally, we know that patients who have underlying predisposing conditions also have an increased mortality. Cardiovascular disease has a strong association with an increased mortality in COVID-19, diabetes as well. If a patient has no underlying health condition, the mortality is much lower. And I think this is a helpful chart to demonstrate how certain conditions correlate with the risk of hospitalization and ICU admission. And I just wanna point out three things on this particular chart, which is chronic renal disease, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. These are really the three conditions that um, predispose significantly to increased risk of hospitalization and ICU admission. Finally, a lot of people are asking me how this compares to the seasonal influenza epidemics. And I would just point out that all comers, all ages, the mortality in influenza is about 0.1% perhaps. It's about 10 to 25 times higher for COVID-19. And that's something that's similar across all age groups as well. Also, one thing I have to note about the epidemiology is this R not value, just because it's so important in describing epidemics. It describes the number of new infections in a naive population. So influenza has an R not of about 1.3. But one of the challenges that's made COVID-19 so difficult is the R not is about 2.2, meaning the average infected patient infects 2.2 other people. And the reason this is key is because the number of infections will continue to increase as long as that R not value is above one. Finally, at Mount Sinai Hospital, we know all too well during the peak uh, a few weeks ago that we had almost 2,000 confirmed inpatients at one time throughout the Mount Sinai Hospital system, including 452 patients in our ICUs. And then just one projection of the future, looking at the epidemiology of what, what, what might be to come. This is the famous model by the IHME, Chris Murray out of Seattle, who it's been revised many times, but the latest model as of today is projecting that over the course of the summer, um, we may um, reach about 134,000 deaths. Uh, that is the current projection in the United States. <laughs> 
I want to take one minute to talk about clinical before taking the last 10 to discuss imaging. So um, we know that it's the positive PCR test that, it, that really hinges, the diagnosis really hinges on that positive test. It's highly specific, but the sensitivity is very variable. Uh, here at Mount Sinai, I think the PCR tests we're using have a sensitivity of approximately 70%. So that is a relatively high false negative rate for the swabs. And also this is a disease that has an incubation period of a median of five days, but can be long as long as two weeks. And patients are particularly infectious and contagious early in the disease course, which, is, which I think is important to keep in mind. This is good data from the, uh, an, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine that describes that the viral load is much higher in patients early on in, in disease course. So patients are more contagious and more infectious and have higher viral loads early on in disease time course. Uh, we know about the laboratory findings. I won't take some of this. We know about the media and uh, other laboratory findings that are helpful to keep in mind. We all know, are, are, we are all, all familiar with the symptoms, fever, cough, and dyspnea. Also, I just want to point that GI symptoms are important. There are some patients that present with only GI symptoms, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and may have no respiratory complaints. In addition, anosmia and hyposmia, loss of uh, taste or smell, sm smell or taste are also um, important to keep in mind. This is actually not that uncommon and sometimes patients who have otherwise no symptoms may have only anosmia, loss of smell. So that's something that uh, is, is good to keep in mind. Uh, again, fever being the most common thing, but we shouldn't forget about some of these other things including the abdominal symptoms that happen at a lower per uh, percentage of the time. And one, one chart that I think is helpful, a lot of people are wondering about the difference between COVID-19 and the common cold and influenza. And now that we're in the spring, allergies. There's a lot of overlap between these nonspecific symptoms. So this part can help educate between these things. So for example, I'll note that shortness of breath is extremely common in COVID-19, but it's actually incredibly rare uh, with the common cold and the flu. So that can be one feature that can distinguish. In addition, there are other things that are helpful. For example, sneezing really does not happen in COVID-19. So that's actually something that's important to know. Now that allergy season is, uh, is on the upsurge, uh, it, it's a helpful distinguishing factor between those. Finally, we know that patients um, who are infected with COVID-19 usually have mild disease. About 80% of patients have mild symptoms, and so only a smaller percentage that have severe symptoms or are critical. This uh, chart on the right is uh, data from China that shows a similar theme where of all the cases, most of them are mild, a smaller percentage of them are severe, and an even smaller percentage result in death. And in terms of identifying the severity, this is the algorithm that I think we're all familiar with at Mount Sinai and distinguishing patients and categorizing them as mild, moderate, or severe or with endocrine damage or with the cytokine release syndrome. And finally, I want to take the last few minutes to focus on imaging. As a radiologist, this is certainly my focus, and um, I, hopefully it'll be helpful to have some um, context of the imaging. So chest radiography. Adam, Adam Marty Goldman, um, can I just interrupt you for a moment before we get to the imaging part? Yes. So I just want everyone um, to be aware that Adam uh, has provided online through View Medicine probably 10 or so really uh, excellent uh, online lectures on COVID. So he's become uh, the internet guru on COVID. Um, can I ask you just a question to, because you've been addressing so much of the epidemiology, can you um, give some insight on why New York City has been the epicenter? And there was an article in the Times uh, to say that uh, it spread from New York um, to the United States, but New York may have gotten the virus initially from Europe, not from China, so shutting down China late may not have made a difference. George Cyrus gave us a really uh, excellent lecture talking about the socioeconomic issues um, distinct to Queens and potentially to some of the other boroughs, which may have made New York City particularly susceptible and a target. Um, with your knowledge, can you weigh in a little bit on why New York has been the epicenter? Yeah, it's a really good question, and I think the answer to that is multifactorial. First of all, New York, New York City is just a perfect setup in terms of its population density. Not only is New York City the largest city in the United States, it's also the one that has the largest population density. It's also an international city with a lot of international travel and traffic. And uh, you, yes, it's true that there has been some thought that the initial index case in New York may have been from Europe rather than from Asia. It's hard to know for sure. 
And either way, I think it would have reached here at some point. But New York is just such a high traffic area for international travel, coupled with the high population density. And as you mentioned, there are socioeconomic issues as well at play, particularly in some parts of New York City that um, may also be sort of a factor. So I, I think it's really a combination of all of those things together mm -hmm. that have uh, really allowed New York City to surge as the epicenter throughout the country. If you look there, cities like Tokyo or at places in, in India, um, Beijing, which are certainly very dense uh, centers. Is there something distinct to New York? I, I don't know why many other Chinese cities, including large cities like Beijing and, and Shanghai, had relatively smaller number of cases. That to me is a little bit of a mystery. I think that India, some people have speculated that it's possible that the warmer weather there was a factor. New York when disease was emerging, it was still fairly cold. That may be a factor. Um, cases in, in India have been increasing a little bit more recently, so it could be that the timing is just a little bit different. Uh, I, I think that there are um, uh, sometimes more questions than answers, and sometimes you can only appreciate the answers well in retrospect, uh, but it's probably multifactorial. I, I, I don't know why some cities like Tokyo, Shanghai, and Beijing have had a relatively few number of cases. Okay, please proceed. I apologize for interrupting. No, it's good. So I, I just want to take the last less than 10 minutes to, to touch on the imaging, which is um, which is really our focus here in radiology. And first of all, chest radiography, we know is um, is something that's done all the time. It's really considered the first line imaging modality for evaluation of potential COVID-19. We are preferring portable radiographs here because it reduces the risk of transmission to uh, healthcare workers and staff. And the hallmark findings to know are that patients have bilateral hazy and patchy pulmonary opacities, and they often have this characteristic peripheral and or lower lung distribution. This is really the key that is important to keep in mind. And um, about 69% of patients uh, requiring hospital admission re uh, had an abnormal radiograph at the time of admission, and 80% will have an abnormal radiograph at some point during hospitalization. Chest CT, um, its use as a primary screening tool is currently discouraged here in the United States, but when it is performed, there are several typical, typical findings that are helpful. The hallmark finding is ground glass pulmonary opacities, often with a bilateral, peripheral, and lower lung distribution. And the key here also that's sometimes extremely helpful is they can have a rounded morphology, which is quite characteristic. We may also see frank airspace consolidation. And later on in the course of disease, more, more subacute to chronic, we may start to see this reticulation and organization, uh, uh, something called crazy paving and a reverse halo sign, which I'll describe in a moment. And importantly, it's important to note, there are also some pertinent negatives that the, we don't typically see on imaging these patients. Pleural effusions, cavitation, pulmonary nodules, and lymphadenopathy are notably characteristically absent in patients with COVID-19. So if we see those things, we may be thinking about other diseases instead. Um, this rounded morphology is really typical. If you see these lesions that have this shape that's very rounded, thing that we're seeing a lot in COVID-19, Crazy paving is when you have round glass with interlobular and intralobular septal thickening here. It's called a crazy paving pattern. That's something that we see in some cases of COVID-19. And the reverse halo sign is where you have an area of lung that is uh, denser along its periphery and more lucent centrally. It's called a reverse halo sign. And it's something that we're also seeing in some cases of, of COVID-19. And I just wanna show a few imaging examples. I think it's helpful for everybody that their eyes should just see a few examples of what the disease often looks like here we have these ground glass opacities, but again, they're arranged along the periphery, along the outer portion of the lung. This is something that's really atypical for a lot of other infections, but is quite characteristic of COVID-19. Here again, you can appreciate that peripheral lung distribution. Here the disease is more diffuse, where you have these ground glass opacities kind of everywhere. That's something that we see also as disease progresses. And then here I'm showing a coronal CT image where you can appreciate that some of the lesions, some of these ground glass lesions are more round in shape. Again, that's something that um, is pretty characteristic in many cases. Here's another great example where the lesions just have this sort of round shape in the lung. And um, our group here at Mount Sinai, uh, a credit here goes to the, our entire radiology team here at Mount Sinai, where we looked at um, a number of cases and categorized patients' opacities um, on chest CT. And we found that first of all, um, almost all patients had either ground glass or consolidation if they had opacities, but it's very rare to have consolidation without ground glass. Um, and then there is a slight lower lung distribution with the lower lobes 
being affected a little bit more commonly than the upper lobe. So it's helpful to know as well. And uh, I just want to point out here that, uh, again, pleural nodule, pulmonary nodules, pleural effusions, and lymphadenopathy were really absent in pretty much all of the cases that we, we examined, which is uh, helpful to keep in mind as well. And this chart has a lot of information. I, I just want to highlight a couple of key take-home points from it, which is that we were able to correlate the patient's chest CT from the time of symptom onset. And we categorized patients in three groups, either early, intermediate, or late. A patient was considered early if they had their chest CT within two days of symptom onset, intermediate if their, chest CT, if their initial chest CT was between three and five days of symptom onset, and later if it was after six days. And I just, this is a dense chart, the interested listener can go to an article in radiology to see more, but I just want to highlight a few uh, things. First of all, um, patients who um, sometimes had a negative scan if they were imaged early, 56% of patients that were imaged within two days of symptom onset with CT had a negative CT. So that's important to know that chest CT does not reliably rule out COVID-19 early on in disease. That becomes very low um, in the intermediate and late stages. But you can get false negatives on CT early. Finally, uh, in addition, the, the further along in disease time course we go, the more likely patients are to have bilateral lung involvement. This peripheral lung distribution is something that uh, we described uh, a few slides ago, is also something that becomes increasingly common as the disease time course progresses. And uh, throughout the entire time course, uh, the uh, nodules, effusions, and lymphadenopathy are really absent. This is just a, a, a table a chart that kind of shows all of this information, I think, uh, best just in, in one bar graph, which shows that, again, normal chest CTs are seen a, a, just over half the time within the first two days of infection, uh, but become much less likely in the intermediate and late stages. And then um, I'd also just like to emphasize here again that consolidation, bilateral lung disease, and a peripheral lung distribution are all typical findings that become increasingly common as the disease time course progresses. And finally, I think it's helpful to think about the role of imaging and when it's appropriate to order chest radiographs and chest CT. There are a number of imaging societies that have weighed in with guidelines and physician statements over the course of the last several days, including the ACR, the STR, the RSNA, the Flight, and the Fleischner Society. And I just want to um, draw the listeners uh, that they should be aware of these uh, guidelines that might be helpful in clinical management. Uh, for example, the American College of Radiology was really um, feeling that CT should not be used to screen for or as a first-line test to diagnosis COVID-19. Uh, this is in contrast to other countries. For example, initially in China, chest CT was used as a diagnostic tool. Uh, you might remember there was a day back in February of 2020 where the number of cases in China uh, spiked by 15,000 just in one day, which is because that was when they allowed CT alone to be used as a diagnostic, to count as a diagnostic positive COVID-19 even in the absence of a PCR test. So here in the United States and some European countries, um, the, the initial thought was to reserve uh, chest CT for a much, much more limited um, uh, application. And it was felt to be inappropriate to screen large volumes of cases as a first line test. And the ACR emphasized that CT should be used sparingly and, resolved, and reserved for hospitalized symptomatic patients with specific clinical indications. Uh, I'll just point the interested listener to the ACR's website if they want to read the full guideline and policy statement. The Society of Thoracic Radiology also came out with a statement against recommending routine use of uh, CT screening uh, for patients under investigation. Um, and they felt that CT would, is best used for patients suspected of having complications such as abscess or empyema. Again, you can consider the STR website if you want to see the full statement. The RSNA also provided an expert consensus guidelines. Um, their role was really to help the radiologist in standardized reporting to look at different findings. And they categorized patients as having either a typical appearance, an indeterminate appearance, an atypical appearance, or negative for pneumonia. And this is something to help communication, uh, sort of clear standardized communication amongst radiologists and clinicians. So um, these are the RSNA guidelines that uh, are available also if, for the interested listener. The Fleischner Society, which is a multinational, a multidisciplinary organization comprised of radiologists, oncologists, pathologists, and others, um, had a much more uh, um, open-minded view of using imaging. They actually felt that 
while imaging is not routinely indicated as a screening test in asymptomatic individuals, they did say that chest CT um, is appropriate for patients with more moderate to severe future features. So it's a little bit different than the ACR. Um, they felt the imaging was indicated in patients with worsening respiratory status. So it's just a much more, um, they, they were much more open in, to, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the um, or criteria to, to warrant a chest CT. And the, Fleisch, the full Fleischner Society statement is uh, available on their website, and I would encourage people to, who are interested to, to, to see the full uh, uh, um, guideline there as well. And finally, the last, the last thing I want to mention is just uh, we do cardiac uh, imaging here, and um, both the Society of Cardiovascular CT and the SEMR have weighed in with um, position statements as well. I think it's helpful to be aware of those. So the SCCT has suggested deferring cardiac CT exams, which can be safely postponed in order to minimize the risk of exposure to patients and staff. I think we know that here at Mount Sinai, we have an excellent cardiac CT program where we image about 35 cardiac CTs per day on a regular, on a regular basis. But now that number has been cut by about 90%. Uh, we're really just doing a couple of cases a day. We're really trying to minimize uh, the number of, of uh, cases in the, and the exposure to staff. Uh, so that is appropriate according to the SCCT during this time. Um, and you always have to just weigh the benefit at, versus the risk of doing the test uh, of doing a cardiac CT in patients with COVID-19. This is something that really I, I would encourage a consideration on a case-by-case -case basis and discussion with the ordering physician who and, and the cardiologist and the radiologist in order to determine on a case-by-case -case basis right now here, especially at Mount Sinai, whether or not a cardiac CT should be performed or it can be safely postponed uh, until the risk of exposure is, is more minimal later on. So this is a, an important discussion to have that, uh, again, I would focus the, the, uh, on, on a case-by-case -case basis. The SCCT full statement can be seen on their website. And finally, the SCMR is also weighed in and, and it's really just said avoid a cardiac MR unless absolutely clinical, clinically necessary. And the full SCMR statement is available on their website as well. Thank you very much for, for everybody's time. Uh, Adam, Marty Goldman again. Um, yesterday, um, we had a, a wonderful discussion about some of the pulmonary findings, and there was a discussion of the L, the low elastins versus H, the high elastins um, type of lung, and uh, the treatment for it was a little bit different, as were if the patient were ventilated, the vent settings. Um, can you differentiate those two types by CT? I'm sorry, could, could, could you repeat the question one more time? Which yeah, clinically, there's two types of lung disease that the spectrum from low elastins uh, mm -hmm. to high elastins. And based upon the pattern of elastins and basically whether it's a wet lung or a dry lung, uh, they determine sort of uh, uh, pulmonary treatment. And the I question is, can you differentiate those types um, by CT? I think there might be some uh, features that are different. I think there's a lot of overlap and in a lot of cases it would be very difficult to make that distinction. But there are some patients, especially later in the disease that have uh, more reticulation and organization as the disease evolves and progresses, it starts to organize. And uh, the patients may have a more restrictive pattern that might be seen on PFTs or elastins. And that's something that, um, that there is, I think it's a spectrum and, uh, and, and there's a bell curve. And I think there's a lot of overlap, but on the two extremes, we may be able to see some features that could show that a disease does have more of that sort of restrictive reticular organized fibrosing pattern. And what will be interesting to see going forward over the course of the next uh, several weeks and months is to see if those patients are more likely to fibrose and scar and wind up with chronic long-term sequelae and fibrosis from their COVID-19 versus those that resolve and heal completely without sequelae. Before introduces the next part. Uh, any comments about the C, uh, cardiac CT or cardiac MR from uh, Dr. Larakis, uh, Gina, Adam, or Javier? Yeah, I think I think that was an excellent overview uh, by Dr. Uh, Bernheim, and I think for the interest of the time, uh, we'll move uh, to the case. Uh, so then. Next case will be presented by Dr. Tamala, and uh, who is the fellow in uh, Mount Sinai West uh, with Dr. Kukar as the her mentor. So, uh, thank you very much, Adam, for this uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. So, Dr. Kukar and Dr. Tamala. Please um, look at the bottom, look at the share the screen. Can you share the screen? Uh, 
Todo fruta mala. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the conference. Today, we're going to discuss an interesting case that we have um, um, in our hospital. So the case starts with a 62-year-old male comes to the ED complaining of chest tightness. He describes the chest tightness as substernal, radiating, worsening with exertion for the past one day. His associated symptoms have been shortness of breath and exertion and palpitations for the last three days. And uh, he denied any fevers, loss of smell, taste, or abdominal symptoms. His, uh, he, had exercise, uh, he had excellent exercise tolerance until his symptoms started. The vital signs in the ED were significant for tachycardia of 130 beats per minute, otherwise afebrile with pulse ox of 98% on room air, blood pressure of 136 over 70. A brief about his past history, which is significant for hypertension and hyperlipidemia. His contact, his wife had recently been admitted um, and was uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 pneumonia and was treated for severe acute respiratory syndrome. Social history, non-smoker, non non-alcoholic, denied any recreational drugs. He uses amlodipine, losartan, and atorvastatin at home. Physical exam in the ED was pretty much benign, uh, except for uh, him being tachycardic. So investigation, the lab tests that were done in the ED um, were actually pretty much uh, with the normal limits except for elevated transaminases uh, like we see on the screen, increased AL ALT and AST. D-dimer was um, 0.46. He, his initial troponin I was 0.3 and the one repeated after four hours um, was elevated to one. His lipid panel had elevated LDL and elevated triglycerides, and COVID-19 PCR was sent at that time. His initial EKG on the presentation, which was done, um, showed sinus tachycardia with mild um, S to minimal ST depressions and anterolateral leads. At this time, um, keeping a 62-year-old guy who comes in with chest tightness with past history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and the COVID-19 pandemic era, these were the differentials uh, that comes to our mind. COVID-19 pneumonia, PE, acute coronary syndrome, or myocarditis. So imaging was done in the ED for ruling out PE for, because of the process of having thromboembolic disease associated with COVID-19 in a patient who presents with shortness of breath and exertion. So however, CT chest was negative for pulmonary embolism. The uh, uh, CT shows peripheral ground glass opacity suggestive of COVID-19 pneumonia, like the arrow marks are pointing on the screen. The CT was not gated for coronary angiogram. However, we could see um, severe proximal LED calcification. So the clinical course, patient was admitted on the floor. It was treated as NSTEMI with heparin drip and dual antiplatelets with aspirin and brillanta. The subsequent labs came back by the time COVID-19 PCR was detected. His stroke peaked at 2.8. He had elevated ferritin and LDH. His, however, his ESR, CRP, um, interleukin, and fibrinogender within normal limits. So with this 62-year-old uh, guy presenting with chest tightness, elevated cardiac biomarker, what would we do next? This was the EKG that was done next day when the pain was uh, when the patient was chest pain free, which shows normal sinus rhythm, PAC, and the minimal ST depressions normalized. So this was a thought process. How do we proceed further in this COVID-19 pandemic era? The patient who comes in with chest pain has elevated cardiac biomarkers. Should the patient be taken to the cat lab? How were the risk uh, of this patient being exposed to the staff is too high? Should we just medical management? Or what would, we, what would the imaging modalities uh, we should do to actually help us guide in the further management of this case? So the choice of imaging modality and the thought process that we had, um, that we did in this patient was echocardio, if it was not a COVID-19 pandemic era, echocardiogram is however the standard of care that we usually do in such patients to uh, check for their EF and wall motion abnormalities that would guide us in the further uh, management of this patient. However, there is significant increased exposure to the sonographer because of the time it takes to acquire the images. And the mechanism of troponin elevation may not be elucidated with the echocardiogram. Cardiac MR was chosen as the imaging modality of choice. Uh, because of the thought 
minimal exposure to the technologist. There's uh, PPE available uh, and the protocol have been very well defined to uh, prevent the exposure. And a gold standard for LBEF, and it can detect subtle wall motion abnormalities, like it happened in our case, which we'll see further. It also indicates whether the troponin elevation was and which will actually in guiding and answering a few questions on the patient management. So cardiac uh, MR was done in our patient, and these are the semi images of the uh, CMR. On the left, we see a two-chamber image of the CMR that shows a subtle mid anterior wall motion abnormality. In the middle, we see a short axis of the CMR. At the <laughs> How have you been? It shows a pink point and uh, also a subtle mid anterior wall motion abnormality. On the right, we see uh, we see the short axis at the basal ventricular level, which shows a normal anterior wall motion. Cool. Other um, images of the cardiac MR. Here, cool see that there's a delayed image showing a delayed subendocardial enhancement. The short axis view a delayed subendocardial enhancement of the anterior wall involving less than 50% of the wall. A T2 sequence that shows myocardial edema of the anterior wall. So the findings of the MR of uh, delayed subendocardial enhancement with the subtle um, mid anterior wall motion abnormality, such as recent impact. So, from the leading findings and um, his uh, elevated cardiac biomarkers in the presentation of the patient, the patient was treated with the regimen of aspirin, brillanta, atorvastatin, and metoprolol. His EKG had no subsequent changes. His troponin drowned trended, and he remained chest pain in his hospital course. Interventional cardiology was consulted, and the decision was made to pursue angiography as an outpatient, given his COVID-19 positive status and his stable clinical course. So from this case, we just briefly want to uh, bring up the discussion of the choice of imaging modality that we use in our patients. It's to have elevated cardiac biomarkers with the normal limits inflammatory markers, and how would we proceed further? But before that, I just want to briefly bring up the lessons that we learned about uh, pathophysiology of myocardial injury in COVID-19. So some of the lessons that we learned from Wuhan, there are a few reports that came out that suggested that among the people who died from COVID-19, 11.8% of patients without underlying cardiovascular disease had substantial heart damage with MNI or cardiac anesthetic hospitalization. Another report of 138 COVID-19 patients, the levels of cardiac myomarkers of myocardial injury were higher in patients who were treated in ICUs compared to the ones who were not. So these lessons just tell us that myocardial injury in COVID-19 patients is not uncommon. Similar results were actually found from the data in our own health system. Uh, a comprehensive analysis that was done by Dr. Lala and Dr. Fuster and Mount Sinai team, which was beautifully represented in this graphical representation. So uh, in 2,736 COVID positive patients who had troponin I that was done within the first 24 hours, there was a prevalence of 40% prevalence of COVID elevation of cardiac biomarkers in these patients. Left bottom, we see a graph that shows uh, that the cardiac biomarkers were elevated in patients who had history of cardiovascular disease compared to the patients who did not have any history of cardiovascular disease. On the right, we see that patients who had elevated cardiac biomarkers had higher mortality compared to the patients who had uh, normal cardiac biomarkers. That is a red. And also the paper very beautifully describes about the mechanism of the myocardial injury that can happen in COVID-19 patients. It could be inflammation, microthrombi, acute coronary syndrome, direct viral invasion, or supply was system and imbalance. In, in, in this uh, case series and the study, it was seen that most of the patients had uh, elevated cardiac biomarkers and that could be from inflammation or supply was system and imbalance. This is another pictographical representation from uh, European Society of Cardiology that uh, tells us uh, about the proposed mechanisms of the myocardial injury that can happen in COVID-19 patients. 
In COVID-19, because of the inflammation, uh, because of the inflammation, there's a cytokine storm that can happen, leading to elevated cardiac biomarkers that could cause myocarditis or myocardial dysfunction, leading to symptoms of heart failure or arrhythmias. Or they could be some endothelial dysfunction causing microvascular endothelial dysfunction or, micro, uh, or macrovascular leading to acute coronary syndrome, or these inflammatory biomarkers can cause a plaque instability causing rupture leading to ACS. So the same thing in a brief, uh, a brief representation of what could be the plausible mechanisms of the myocardial injury. Actually, in the we actually in, we know that acute plaque or demand ischemia is possible in patients who have acute viral or bacterial illness. And these are the two um, NEGM articles that actually beautifully explain uh, the mechanism that can happen. The, the top uh, of the picture shows the type 1 MI that happens because of the increased procoagulants and activated platelets uh, secondary to the inflammation that happens leading to acute plaque rupture. The bottom of the image tells us uh, that the inflammation leads to the increase in the inflammatory uh, response in the body that causes the demand and uh, demand uh, demand and need supply. Last but not the least, the, another proposed mechanism that has been uh, lately very interesting uh, finding is the direct myocardial toxicity that happens in COVID-19 patients due to the ACE2 receptors involvement. The ACE2 is widely expressed not only in the lungs, but also in the cardiovascular system. In addition, the ACE2 has been identified as a functional receptor for coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2. ACE2-related signaling pathways might have a role in the direct myocardial toxicity. Last is a proposed mechanism that's uh, lately been discussed a lot about the possible thrombosis of the vessels that happen due to the inflammation in these patients. This was a, a review article that came out from Columbia last week, which says that the increased inflammatory response uh, leads to lymphopenia and elevated inflammatory cytokines like CRP, increased IL-6, could cause hemostatic abnormalities like pulmonary microthrombi, intravascular coagulopathy, or increase in cardiac myomarkers, leading to increased D-dimers, increased fibrin degradation products, or uh, thrombocytopenia, and the clinical outcomes that can happen can be in the form of a venous thromboembolism or myocardial infarction or a disseminated intravascular coagulation. So having all these pathophysiology mechanisms in our mind, can we bring all what we learned into our patient and see and answer some questions? What type of myocardial injury occurred in our patient? From the imaging, find, uh, imaging findings that we have seen in the CMR that uh, the proposed mechanism that we think could have happened is the acute plaque rupture that could have happened because of the inflammation due to COVID-19 status. What imaging modalities can help determine the etiology? Can, can you talk louder on the microphone, please? please. What are the imaging modalities that can help determine the etiology of myocardial injury? There are a lot of imaging modalities like echocardiogram, cardiac CT, cardiac MR that are available and which have their own risks and benefit that help us in knowing the etiology of the troponin elevation or the elevated cardiac biomarkers that can help. But however, there are advantages and disadvantages to each modality in the COVID-19 pandemic era. What medical therapy is appropriate? We have a lot of discussion that's coming up about the use of uh, anticoagulants in COVID-19 patients because of the acute inflammatory status that they develop. However, in our patient, we had only elevated cardiac biomarkers and the inflammatory markers were within normal limits and the patient was just treated for NSTEMI with uh, heparin antiplatelets. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mala. That was excellent. Can we go back to the MR imaging? And can I ask Stam or some yeah. of the other experts on the line? Can you differentiate 
um, whether that's focal myocarditis or if that's a microvessel injury or, or a macro, it certainly doesn't look like transmural. So yeah. can you differentiate based upon this imaging? Is this focal myocarditis or is this an ischemic injury yeah. or a combination? Yeah, I can I can take that. I think, uh, you know, it's a classic uh, uh, subendocardial um, infarct uh, because uh, you know, usually myocarditis most of the time causes uh, intramyocardial uh, hyperenhancement, but this is uh, classic for uh, subendocardial infarct and actually is not uh, transmural, it's almost uh, 50%. Because I don't know if the image maybe is not shown well, but uh, it's almost 50% uh, white, as you can see, which is the dead myocardium, and 50% on top of that is the alive myocardium. So. Uh, and also, uh, you can see that also on the short axis view on the middle. And then I think what is uh, very important in this case is the T T2 weight image, you know, because uh, that shows edema. So that means that the, uh, the myocardial infarction is acute, like uh, something happened uh, recently, you know, that day or the day before. And that's very important because otherwise, without having the T2 weight image, you will not be able to tell if it's, uh, because this can be an old infarct. The patient could have an infarct in the past and so has happened to cardiac infarct. But the, having the T2 weight image, I think, is, uh, gives it that it's uh, something that happened uh, very recently. And uh, that's, I think, the importance of this case. And I will ask uh, Javier if he has any comments uh, about this. No, I fully agree. I mean, what this is showing you is that this is an ischemic injury. It doesn't tell you whether it's because of a plaque rupture or it could yeah. be maybe like an embolism in the coronary arteries or vasospasm or anything like that. So it doesn't tell you that, but it doesn't go with myocarditis. Yeah. Can I ask you then, if you did this imaging test and you were looking to differentiate between whether this was coronary disease or myocarditis, why didn't you pursue coronary intervention at this point or at an earlier point if it was high in your differential? because salvaging myocardium is obviously um, first and foremost, and it's going to be most effective if done early. Here we did two complex imaging tests, um, but not doing cardiac catheterization. I can answer that, Dr. Goldman. Uh, it's Nina Kukar. Um, so basically this patient, uh, we actually spoke to interventional, and I know they're changing the guidelines um, with what we do at Sinai, but given the patient was um, COVID positive and clinically stable, he remained hemodynamically and electrically stable throughout his course. Um, so even with this, the decision was made to delay um, angiography. Um, with regards to, you know, and Sri brought up a beautiful point at the end of this that, um, you know, with, with the thrombosis and the thromboembolus, as Javier also said, we don't really know if this was acute plaque rupture or thrombosis. Um, you know, but I think with the low inflammatory markers and knowing that he probably had a recent acute myocardial infarction, that gu guided our decision to continue him on DAPT therapy uh, versus putting him on a NOAC. Um, and so that was what was kind of interesting about the management in this case. Dr. Sharma, do you want to comment or Dr. Kinney about uh, individualizing and personalizing the decision to intervene on patients? Dr. Sharma, no. So, Dr. Larakis, do you want to um, postpone? I know you have yeah. at least another case. We could do yeah. it on another day rather yeah. than yes I, yes, I think uh, for the interest of time and everybody most likely has a lot of things to do, maybe they, we can postpone and do the next case with some other cases on the next time. I want to ask if uh, uh, Gina, Dr. Larocca, has anything to say about uh, the case and Dr. Is, I don't know if she's in the line. Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, Dr. Larocca. Sure. Uh, no, excellent case. Great presentation. Um, I think that the only um, comment that I'll make, it goes along with the publications that have been out in the last week, that we're not seeing a lot of um, inflammatory um, myocarditis. We're just not seeing it. It's just, if it, 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 whatever, whoever we've imaged so far hasn't been for myocarditis in these COVID patients. So that goes along with what's been published and what um, we've been mentioning all week with, um, uh, with Dr. Sharma and, and so forth. So um, what we thought might have initially been an, an inflammatory storm 
of the myocardium. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case, at least right now on cardiac MRI. Thank you, Gina. It's uh, Steve Well, I had a quick comment. Um, a, a very nice case. I think um, what's interesting is, um, as everyone has already said, the subendocardial does, I think, agree, I suggest, suggest the ischemic etiology. But it's also kind of weird that it's just mid, mid anterior as opposed to, you know, the extent of the LED distribution typically involving the apex and the, and the apical anterior. So just an interesting observation from my perspective. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, uh, Steve. Um, also, uh, Dr. Jacobi, any any comment or do, if you're online on the line? Uh, uh, no, Stan. Thanks. Oh. Great presentations. And uh, Dr. Bernheim, any comment? So, so I think. Well, uh, I, can I can I just ask you to go through maybe ask each section head, what's the current policy as we're opening up? Uh, as far as imaging electively and emergently and in inpatients. So what's our policy with echo, nuclear, CTMR as we expand imaging uh, yes. for acute? So just to inform everyone of what the current policy is. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, I mean, I can say about everything, but uh, better, uh, Dr. La Roca, Gina, do you, can you say about CMR and uh, CT? Uh, yes, as far as the policy now, yeah. we, we are doing a soft rollout, quote unquote, um, with Dr. Sweeney, obviously, in GP1 Center. And our goal right now is to um, start doing 25% of our CT imaging, which somewhere between five and seven a day. Um, and we're just being very precautious. We, we have to start seeing our patients again who um, have cardiovascular risk factors. We just have to make sure that um, they're not a high risk, uh, either exposed COVID or have symptoms. And we are trying to um, uh, call them before and get an idea uh, of screening prior, prior to be scanned. But again, we're doing about five to seven CTs a day and about two to three cardiac MRIs. We have a list of patients that we have had to cancel since March 13th. Um, and we're calling the attending physicians to see uh, what the um, level of, of necessity is, and if it's high, those are the patients that will be scanned first. And, and what about PPE, uh, Gina, PPE for the staff? And, uh... Yeah, so uh, obviously um, ECHO is probably at highest risk because of time with the patient and, and close proximity, where ECHO might take 40 minutes, 45 minutes, um, stress testing uh, even probably higher. So full PPE should be for the technologists and the nursing staff. CT, um, it's a little bit uh, less risk because um, the time of the CT is less. However, there's still exposure. So we're going to leave that up to our technologists and the nurse um, to see their level. But um, full PPE should be for nuclear echo and especially stress testing. And yeah. then as needed for um, CT. MR yeah. as well. Uh, what about uh, Steve? You are on the line for nuclear. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, so nuclear, um, we're gradually getting our staff back. Uh, they were deployed for um, COVID duty. So this week we've gotten some more nurses and techs back, and then next week we should have most of the people back. Uh, we are open uh, and uh, scanning patients. We have two scanners, so if we, if we do need to do patients at some point that are COVID positive, uh, and we decide that we want to do that, um, then uh, we can dedicate one scanner for that purpose. Um, and there's PPE available down here, and it's a case by case kind of decision. Great. And for uh, Echo, I, again, I want to uh, to echo the, you know, the what Dr. Goldman said in the beginning about Lori that uh, she worked very hard and uh, uh, also she did the. Sam, we lost you. Sam, we lost you. Uh, 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 Sam does not come back. Uh, Echo is along the same lines on the outpatient side as you've outlined already in terms of Joe's guidance. Um, in addition, we are not having people who scan left-handed and would be right in the path of patients' inhalation and exhalation. Um, so it's only the right-handed scanner, so at least the patient's turned away from them. Uh, Dr. Rakas, any um, closing comments? Uh, Dr. Rakas? Uh, 
I think he was disconnected. I just texted ah. him. I'm not sure if you can sign okay. up. Uh, just again, want to thank everyone for their participation. Dr. Ben Heim, thank you so much for the overview. Uh, many of his talks are available on a site called ViewMedi. Uh, this talk will be up on Dr. Sharma's site, CC Live Cases. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma, for that. Um, everyone have a great day. Tomorrow is uh, Heart Failure Team will be presenting cases, uh, Dr. Penny, Dr. Lala, Dr. Mancini, Dr. Moss, Dr. Mitter, etc. Thank you very much. Have a great day.